Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, December 19th. I am today's host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brains. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to just remind everyone, if you ever miss an episode here on Twitch.tv, you can always catch everything later in the day over on YouTube. And to those of you watching over on YouTube, if you want to ask questions, show up to our live recordings most Mondays through Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific at twitch.tv slash CosmoQuestX. We're here to make sure that you know everything that's new in astronomy and space science. Now for today's top story, we have one of the most beautiful images I think I've ever seen of science in the process of getting done. And this isn't beautiful just because of like how it's laid out and how everyone's not actually posed. It's, it's beautiful because it's catching the science as it's done, dirty, with actual lab coats, as do occasionally actually happen. Um, this is basically a sandbox out at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory on the campus of Caltech. And what you're seeing is a mock-up of the area where the InSight lander is located on the red planet. The, the lighting is a really weird shade of yellow because they're trying to simulate the environment where the lander landed, including the lighting conditions. What they're in the process of doing is figuring out how exactly they want to position the seismometer on the surface of Mars. What we see here is a group of blocks tracing out an area in front of the lander. Let me point this out. So these blocks here are tracing out the area in front of the lander where they'll be able to position the seismograph on the surface. They've actually put various chunks of rock in there that are roughly the same size and shape of what they're seeing in the images on InSight to do the best they possibly can to simulate the area. You see over in this left-hand corner, one scientist just sitting on a bag of gravel that was used to simulate the lunar surface. You see the granite blocks laid out around it that uh, are cordoning in everything. And I just, I could look at this all day. You see people have their cameras with them. They're just leaning on the railings, watching this person seems to be looking over and talking to someone else who has a notepad out. This is science as it happens, and sometimes science as it happens is truly beautiful. And uh, I hope you all enjoy this behind the scenes look as much as I have. This is what it takes to figure out exactly how they're gonna deploy that arm on the red planet to measure the interior of Mars. Okay, so moving on to our next story. Researchers at the universities of Zurich and Cambridge have been studying a new class of exoplanets being discovered around distant stars. In this, in this case, these worlds are several times the mass of Earth, and they're snuggled up right next to hot stars. And and this combination of factors means that these worlds have extraordinarily high temperatures. And as we work on studying them, it's turning out that these worlds are also made up of large quantities of calcium and aluminum and all the related minerals. And when you put together this temperature, when you put together the high mass, which means high gravity and high pressure, and these particular, well, chemical abundances, it looks like these worlds are largely made, not majority made, but like a, a regular part of their composition is sapphire and ruby. So it's not Lucy in the sky and diamonds. Those are white dwarf stars. We've, we've determined that dynamically 
white dwarf stars are largely diamond. In this case, these planets are sapphires and rubies, and that's just kind of cool. Um, so physics, it creates cool things and cool and in sometimes really, really hot locations all over our galaxy. And continuing today's just plain pretty science, we have the kind of story that you see coming out of a lot of the observatories around Christmas time when spacecraft give the only gift they know how to give, which is pretty pictures. Um, <laughs> hey, Larry, welcome. Um, so in this case, these pretty pictures are brought to us by the Chandra X-ray Observatory and a variety of other telescopes all over the world. And this is Chandra's Christmas gift to all of you. Up here in the upper left-hand corner, we have the supernova remnant E0102-72.3. This is a massive star that exploded in the nearby small Magellanic cloud. So this is a object that those of you down in the southern hemisphere have the capacity to go out and look. Where you see blue and purple in this particular image, that's where X-ray energy is being emitted by the supernova remnant. Um, in this particular case, we're seeing that there's a great deal of oxygen in the ring and uh, the red and green that you're seeing is optical light that was collected by the Hubble Space Telescope and by the Very Large Telescope in Chile. So this is really an international image that was created by telescopes from the European Southern Observatory, NASA, and ESA. Now, moving over one spot to the right, we have the galaxy cluster Abel 370. This is a massive cluster of galaxies that's located about 4 billion light years away. Where you see blue in this image, that's the X-ray light being emitted by extraordinarily hot intercluster gas. This is gas that has been gravitationally stripped out of the myriad of galaxies that are orbiting one another in this system. That gas gets heated up by the, am the massive amount of gravity and uh, shines in the X-ray light. This image, once again, has been combined with optical images. In this case, it is optical images that were taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of cool. Um, so the next image over to the right, this is Messier 8, otherwise known as the Lagoon Nebula, and it's a favorite target for amateur astronomers. So many of you may have looked at this with your backyard telescope. What we see in this particular image is um, hot pink knots of X-ray light superimposed on um, images taken at the Mount Lemmon Sky Center in Arizona. Arizona. That's the blue and white imagery that is in optical light. Those hot pink knots are showing us where the hot young stars are located in this nebula. Those systems are stars that are very young. They're giving off high energy x-ray emissions, just blasting the solar systems, forming around them with the kind of light that would kill any early life. Luckily, these hot stars don't live very long, and over time, this system will settle down to be a nice, safe place to be a solar system. Now, continuing through these images, we have another Christmas present, this one not quite as beautiful. This lower left-hand image is what may be one of the ugliest images I've ever seen of the Orion Nebula, but this is what happens when you uh, combine radio emission, which is the purple in this image, with X-ray emission. This is, in this case, the blue dots in this image. And what they're doing is they're mapping out the young hot stars yet again. Um, young stars, in addition to giving off X-ray light, also 
uh, have jets coming off of their rotational axes that uh, give off radio emission. Um, and that radio emission is permeating all the gas and dust throughout this system. So here we go with a stellar, ne stellar nebula and an image of what it would look like in all the colors we can't see with our eyes, from the hot pink radio, which is redward of what we can see, to the white blue points of x-ray light, which is far bluer than what we can see. Now here, in the lower center, we have an image that, well, looks like something we understand. This is very clearly a galaxy. In this case, it's the galaxy Messier 33, or the Triangulum Galaxy. It's another part of our local group of galaxies, along with the Andromeda system. This particular spiral galaxy is only about 3 million light years away. And where you see pink in this system, the pink is the X-ray emission, again, coming from hot stars, and in this case, also coming from neutron stars and energy from uh, accretion disks surrounding black holes. Um, the optical image that you're seeing here is actually an image that was taken by the amateur astronomer Warren Kelly. Um, <coughs> and <coughs> so sorry. The optical image has uh, once again been combined with x-ray light to allow us to just get a deeper understanding of what all is going on in this nearby galaxy. Now this weirdo image in the lower right, this is once again a galaxy cluster. In this case, it's a Bell 2744. This is a really confusing image. This, this particular system is about three and a half billion light years away, and it's called Pandora's Cluster. Um, this is because it has so much different stuff going on. In this particular image, the blue in the image is from X-ray emission. The um, Optical red, green, and blue comes from the Subaru telescope, which was operated by Japan, and the very large telescope operated by the European Southern Observatory. And then superimposed on all of this is yet more red that is coming from the, Jans the very large array, the Carl Jansky Very Large Array down in New Mexico. What we're seeing is the hot gas down in the center of the galaxy. We're seeing galaxies on the outskirts of the system, sorry, the hot gas in the center of the galaxy cluster. We're seeing uh, galaxies that are undergoing massive amounts of star formation and have radio emission in the outskirts of the cluster. And then we just see the cluster itself as all those faint splots of light that aren't actually points. They're small, diffuse galaxies so far away that they just look like points of light on the sky. So this is Chandra's holiday gift to all of you. Enjoy the pretty pictures and all the different kinds of information that can get combined together. When we look at various objects using not just the light we see with our eyes, but x-ray and radio emission as well. So those are today's top stories. As we go into the holiday, we are going to start to get light on the science, or at least the new science. Now, we aren't going to get light on the science communications, however. This weekend, uh, we're going to stream 40 hours of science content right here on CosmoQuest X on Twitch, and you're all invited to join us. Um, we are currently dealing with NASA funding cuts. We have been funded since 2012 by a variety of different NASA missions. Thank you so much for the bits, Keeper of Maps. Um, we've been one funded by a variety of different NASA missions, grants, and cooperative agreements. Unfortunately, we were warned a few months ago that James Webb Space Telescope cost overruns could lead to our funding being cut and uh, it was cut. I'm trying to figure out how to not have to fire all of my staff for Christmas. So 
I am asking all of you to show up and let us sing not just for our supper but for our salary. For 40 hours this weekend we are going to do everything we can to keep you entertained and we're going to ask you to please give. If you think that science and science education deserve more funding, this is your chance to, well, make that come true. Please, please go out, do what it takes to earn bits, go out, find out if your company where you work matches charitable donations. Do what you can and help keep the science coming in the new year. I hate begging for funding. And the way I'm contributing is all the funding you give, it's all going to my staff. I'm only going to pay myself off of grants that we're able to get. This Hangout-a-thon Monday is going to keep our programmers going, keep our educators going, keep Susie, who's out there in the chat, keep her going. So, um, yeah, that's it. I'm not going to take your questions, so please at me in the chat, and uh, I will answer everything I can. So Larry is asking, Annie mentions that Saturn's rings were only a hundred million years old. Did a moon reach Roche limit then? So for those of you who don't know, the Roche limit is when an object gets close enough to a much bigger gravitational object that the tidal forces of the thing it's getting near are able to tear it apart. This can be um, one star gets too close to a um, more massive star. This can be a small moon gets too close to a planet. This can be any number of different things. Roche limit means gravity overcomes the chemical bonds, everything else that holds an object together. With Saturn, Something got shredded to create those rings. We don't know if it was a comet, a Kuiper Belt object that visited from the outer solar system. We don't know if it was a moon that formed in situ. All we know is something got shredded and that something created Saturn's rings. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Yes, the thank you, Hanny's Warverb, that is indeed true. <coughs> so, um, oh, I'm sorry, Guido, that you're lost without Paranor. Um, so, um, yes, Saturn is, is something that we're catching it at a particular moment in its history. When it has these massive rings, they won't be there forever. They weren't there forever but we get to enjoy them for now. And the cool thing is um, Mars inner moon is actually on its way inward and at some point will get shredded the exact same way. And at some point far in the future, Mars is also going to have a ring. Um, so at Henny's Warver, I, so it's possible that Saturn has shredded many moons over time but it's also possible that it's just one object. We don't know. So that's, that's the kind of cool thing. And this is what keeps us doing science. Uh, people often accuse scientists of being know-it-alls. No, we just want to be know-it-alls. And we keep exploring the universe so that we can get step-by-step step a little bit closer to being people who truly do know all there is to know. We're not there yet. Okay, other questions. Um, and I will point out, we are going to have a um, eco server running this weekend. And if you would like to join us and run your own um, sister stream using Tiltify, uh, just reach out to me and I'll make sure that you can be part of our eco server while we try and save the Earth from an incoming asteroid while we work to save science in the stream. I have a few licenses for free, um, so reach out to me if you want to participate and you need a license. Um, so uh, other questions out there in the stream. Hello, Uncle Bill. Um, and hello to all the rest of you out there. Um, scrolling back to see if I missed any questions earlier. 
Um, so Hanny Zorverp had earlier asked, would it be possible to make real-time video that combines normal light with the stuff we can't see? Um, so real-time video is not quite the right word. We can simultaneously observe all these different objects across many different colors, but we can't really do video with things like x-ray and radio because it takes time to put the pictures together. When we look at an image, and let me go back to that set of images, when we look at images like these, the, the way the lower right hand image where purple is radio light, the way that gets put together is, is we take our, I'm going to use this dish as a radio um, dish. We take our dish and we scan it across the sky. And as it does a bunch of different stamps across the sky, it is observing this image one pixel at a time. So we have to build up that image by just observing one pixel at a time, essentially. With X-ray, um, X-rays there's not that many of those photons and we literally count the photons as they come in. So we have to observe each of these fields for sometimes minutes, sometimes hours to get enough photons to put together a pretty picture. So we can observe these objects in all these different colors simultaneously, but because we have to do long duration images, because we have to build these pictures up, in segments, we, we can't really do video. It would be awesome, but technology is just not there yet. Um, yeah, you have to have a really bright x-ray source like is used in medical imaging to be able to do video of x-rays. Um, oh, any other questions out there? Thank you for lurking for a moment, Uncle Bill. Um, so Hanny is asking, would the sun give off a jet if it was hotter? It's not so much that it needs to be hotter as it needs to have an accretion disk. So young hot stars, they also are still in the process of having material flow inwards into the star. And as all of this rotates, it generates a powerful magnetic field. And some of the material that's trying to flow into the star, instead of flowing into the star, instead gets caught up in that magnetic field and jettisoned out the north and south poles of this magnetic field. Essentially, a young star with a strong magnetic field acts just like a electric magnet with the coils going around generate a magnetic field that shoots things through the, the center of that coil. The accretion disk is the coil and the rotational poles end up uh, acting a lot like, um, yeah, the, the magnetic field and the electric magnet. Um, so Kmore101889 is asking, what topics will you all be covering this weekend? So we're going to have a ton of guests coming on. If you um, go to hangoutathon.org and click on the page that says Hangout, and I'm going to see if I can figure out how to share this. One moment. <coughs> yes, okay, I can do this. Um, so we have on our Hangoutathon page um, the schedule is apparent. So in hour one, we're going to have a bunch of the folks from SciStarter coming on to visit. Hour two, this is actually Paul's moving. So hour two um, is going to be spent. Um, introducing you to the eco game, getting things going. We're then having uh, Dr. Karen James come on. She's going to talk about the planet Earth. Uh, um, hour four is going to be more of the game eco, introducing you to all of our other streamers. Um, then we're going to have Dr. Chris Booth coming on in hour five. Um, Veronica Belmont and Tom Merritt are going to be coming on. 
Um, and we're going to be talking about how science and science fiction interact. We basically have guest upon guest, artists, other streamers, Rocket Sage will be part of it. Uh, Scott Manley's coming on. Um, one of the things that has me most excited is Sunday morning. Um, we have Yov Landsman from Space IL, the Israeli space group. Uh, he's coming on to talk about their upcoming moon landing. And we are challenging Scott to replicate what Space IL is doing, but in Kerbal. And so we're going to have them both on at the same time. Go check out the entire schedule. Find out what all is going on. And um, it's not too early to give, so please consider clicking that donate link. Um, I hate begging for money. I really, really hate it, but it needed to be done. Um, so that's, that's what we have planned. So do we have other scientific questions? Um, it, it is going to be epic. Epic is indeed the plan that we have for the weekend. Um, so gluten-free space, which is a truly awesome username, um, is, is asking, do you think we would terraform Mars? And if so, what method would be most effective? So I have really mixed emotions on this one. I've actually been asked to write an opinion piece about this, and I'm still tr struggling with my thoughts. The, the issue is Mars doesn't have a strong magnetic field, so if we terraformed it, it would just be temporary. We also don't know yet if Mars does or doesn't have life. And if we terraformed it, we'd destroy anything that's currently there. So I, I'm still formulating my opinion, still formulating my opinion, don't know. Um, but you have an awesome username. I'm gonna go with you have an awesome username. So Crispy Fried Man um, is asking, what kind of instruments do we need to detect fifth dimensional curvature of the universe? I have no clue. I'm just going to... Theoretical physics is not my thing, and I would have to look that up. It is not information I know. Um, sorry. You have to admit the limits of your understanding. Um... Yes, Hannes Vorver, we can put a bubble around life. And I do think that sometime in the future, and probably not the too extremely distant future, we will have human beings living on both Mars and Moon in um, tunnels uh, that have been adapted and sealed off. It's Both worlds have lava tubes, and by getting underground, you can protect yourself from the radiation of the sun. So someday we will be the mole men and women of Mars and the moon. Um, so yeah. Um, Hanny is asking, would a large star that will only live a short while make planets? Yes, and then it will quickly destroy them. Um, Michael Meyer is asking, will you record the Hangout-a-thon? Yes. Um, I will be away with my family in Burgess throughout and won't have much any time to watch. That's sad, but yes, we will be recording the entire thing. Um, and I'm sorry that you won't be there live. Please be encouraged to stop in periodically. One of the funny things that Annie is inspiring us to do, and Annie is actually gonna be here with me in person in Illinois, is every time our um, donations click over another $100, we're going to be giving the dogs treats. So there will be a dog cam with an actual puppy and Eddie, of course. So Stella and Eddie will be part of this. Welcome, Larry. I'm, I'm sorry that you have a, a things going on. Um, enjoy life. Enjoy life. We're glad you have life. Um, yes, doggy cam with Stella and Eddie will be a thing. Um, we're going to be working on setting things up this afternoon. There may be some sneak peeks and behind the scenes stuff getting posted. So make sure to follow everything on Twitch as well as Twitter. Um, so MMA Fighter 23 is asking, are days longer on other planets? Yes. Um, a day is defined by how long it takes for a given point on the surface of a world to rotate around 
and face the sun again. So, excuse me while I reach around my desk looking for something. So, if we have a, a star and, oh wow, that is totally, it's getting blue screen. Let me grab a different color. Um, a black star is quite boring. Okay, I'm going to use Marvin the Martian, who is also blue screening. This is hilarious. So this is Marvin the Martian, who's blue screening currently. Um, if Marvin the Martian is the sun, and this frog critter is a planet, one day is however long it takes for the planet to go from having, in this case, its eyeballs pointed at the sun, to having its eyeballs pointed at the sun. Now, it's possible that you can have something that is tidally locked, in which case you never really complete a day. It's also possible to have something that is rotating so slowly that it goes around its star before it gets its eyeballs pointed back. So Mars has a day that's only about 45 minutes longer than ours. Jupiter has a day that's only a few hours long. Um, Venus has a day that's longer than its year. Each world has its own rotational rate that is just a factor of, well, the speed it got in its formation and the extra speed it got through collisions and gravitational interactions and a whole lot of other crazy stuff. Um, so Hanny's Warverp is asking, what causes libration? Libration is when a world vibrates somewhat um, and so that it, it doesn't stay perfectly pointed towards us. Um, it can get caused both by just regular instabilities in the system. Um, all sorts of different things can cause libration. Basically, it's getting yanked on. Um, so the cause from one world to the next may not be the same, but it's getting yanked on gravitationally by something else is, is the answer. Um, so all these different day lengths, uh, what do you want? I have a I have a friend. I have a friend who I will pick up. Come here. Come here. I got you. I got you. Okay. This is this is Stella. Um she clearly wants something. She's visiting for a moment. Um I'm holding her so she doesn't destroy anything. Um she will be on the stream this weekend. So, um different day lengths cause life to just interact in different ways. If you think about it, um, there are people on Earth whose bodies would really rather have either a longer or a shorter day. We are, in general, adapted to the 24-hour day. Mars, that only has like an extra 45 minutes, probably won't be a big problem to humans. Um, but other worlds that have days that are months long, we're going to have to have artificial lights for life that's from Earth because our bodies get screwed up when we experience too much light or too much darkness. Um, this is where seasonal affective disorder and so many other things come into play. Now, life can evolve to be used to all of these different cycles. So it's possible that life will find a way to exist on all these different day lengths. Um, Stella does want me to put some uh, science in her head and treats in her tummy, and I think she also wants to go out the way she's licking my arm right now. Um, so other questions before I take off with my doggo. Um, I, I'm sure he has his explosives, but he isn't using them. Um, okay. Yes, Annie uses Cheerios. I will be using BarkBox because um, I have BarkBox treats kind of coming out the ears. I've been saving them up. Um, so Crispy Fried Man is pointing, in total darkness, the human body adjusts to a 25-hour day. And we still don't know why for sure. Huh, that's fascinating. So the Earth Day is slowing down. In the past, we had much shorter days, so human beings evolved with shorter days. 
I wonder why our bodies like longer days. I don't know. Um, but that is today's science. And I have a puppy that wants to go out. Um, and, and I'm gonna take her out. Um, so I will see you all later. There is a rocket launch later today unless it gets scrubbed and Annie will be here to bring you all the explosive goodness and we will both be here tomorrow to bring you science. So thank you all for coming and wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening or afternoon.